Peter Glick and Truth. Um, you might ask what the Heartland Institute, Peter Glick, and the National Center for Science Education have in common. And uh, I, if you're like me, you would have been totally clueless probably about uh, six weeks ago or maybe even uh, closer to now than that. Uh, and I didn't really become aware of this uh, completely until about uh, a week and a half ago or less. Um, and then uh, ran into some absolutely fascinating stuff. The National Center for Science Education, some of you may recognize, is the uh, kind of uh, major institute for promoting um, evolution, uh, defined as uh, unassisted evolution, in uh, schools, colleges, um, and so forth in the United States. It's a rather tangled web, and uh, we, I don't think we even still know all the details, uh, all the facts. Um, some things one can, I guess, surmise, but uh, are not confirmed, and I'll try to um, be as clear as I can at, as what are confirmed facts exceeded, uh, exceeded to by all the important people on both sides, and what are opinions. Um, and therefore, I'm going to try to stick as much as possible to the data itself and not to what people say, although obviously at a certain point, uh, the opinions do tend to become somewhat important. Um, the Heartland Institute, <coughs> as some of you may know, is a conservative think tank that has several different projects going uh, right now, and we're going to find out about them. Um, it sponsors, among other things, the uh, Non-Governmental International P Panel on Climate Change, which is modeled after the United Nations International Panel on Climate Change, and uh, which happens, I guess, the IPCC happens every four years, and this happens usually about two years after the IPCC uh, with, um, uh, shall we say, skeptical people who uh, uh, make comments on the, uh, on the uh, IPCC, things that they think that they got wrong or they left out. It um, has long been suspected, uh, especially by the left, but uh, probably by many people, as being funded by big oil. And uh, the Koch brothers are in the oil business, and so uh, that makes an additional handy person to, uh, people, set of people to suspect as funding all of this stuff. Um, <coughs> recently, and I'm taking this more or less chronologically, documents that were reportedly from the Heartland Institute appeared on uh, several blogs. The, the one that they're still on now that is easy to uh, obtain is uh, the Smog blog. I think there's Think Progress, and at one time they were on Huffington Post and a few other places like that. Um, but uh, what was put there was a package for a board meeting plus a confidential memo. And uh, there's the uh, part of the page. This, uh, for what it's worth, uh, what I'm be showing now are um, uh, screenshots, uh, unedited, um, of, of what, what is posted. And you can see here's the confidential memo, which is headlined. Then there's the minutes of the January board meeting. There's agenda for the board meeting. There's a board meeting package. There's a binder. There's a Heartland budget and a Heartland fundraising plan. These, um, these are kind of boring documents, and I'll show you one of them, and the rest of them are all more or less the same. Um, the uh, Heartland budget and the Heartland fundraising plan are mildly interesting. 
and are more interesting when you compare them to the confidential memo. The memo is what has been normally quoted most of the places that you'll run into this. And then there's the Heartland IRS form, which is alleged to be a public document on this. Um, maybe, I don't know. And then uh, you'll notice that the Heartland Institute has threatened, uh, uh, has claimed that they that the first document here is a fake and has threatened the Desmog blog with legal action. However, the organization has not provided any proof to support its allegations. We see no basis in fact or law for us to remove this document and we'll leave it available in the public interest. Actually, I'm kind of thankful that they did because now I get to look at what they've got up there. Well, here's the one, a sample of one of the other kind of standard routine documents, a notice of regular meeting, and it has a regular meeting at uh, when it's, where it's being held and when, and, and a request for RSVP, and uh, you know, it's not much to it. And uh, we'll move on to the more interesting documents. First is the proposed budget. And um, I, here's the one-page summary of it, and we will not go through the whole budget. We, we don't have time, so don't worry about that. But I will at least show you some of the more salient parts of it. Um, notice that this is confidential. Please do not circulate. Um, and it, um, okay. Projected income, projected overview, personnel budget, how much spending, and uh, here's the summary. Uh, the entire budget, uh, the revenues are, were expected to be, uh, uh, well, the revenues are, were expected in this year to be $7,700,000. 7, uh, $7, and the uh, the budget, f the actual revenues for last year fell a little bit because of the um, recession. And the expenses, um, they're uh, planning to spend a little more. Um, they spent more than they had. They have a shortfall of about $500,000 or $600,000, something like that. Um, they're, uh, uh, and um, because of that, obviously, no bonuses of any kind. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's been a short year for them. Um, and here's where they're expecting to get their fundraising from. Um, the cost of fundraising is expected to be 10.4%, more than 2011's usually low level, but well within the range for recent years. So, uh, personnel budget, and uh, they have the, uh, the multi-year budget for the project and personnel cost for the uh, NIPCC. Um, and I think that that's actually going down just a little bit, um, but they have, uh, they have the budget for the NIPCC project, and this is the personnel budget, and um, they're paying these people this much money, and um, by the way, two of these uh, are actually outside people, including Robert Carter. Um, then they have a bunch of people whom they're paying for uh, various things. And uh, you'll notice that, um, uh, well, I, at least I didn't see anybody that was particularly striking there, except for, I think, um, this uh, Galani, uh, um, who the uh, blogs, I think, are circling in on. Um, And at the bottom of this says that, you know, obviously this is not an exact number. Um, uh, 
And then they have the editorial department, again, a bunch of names that I don't see any obvious uh, people there. Uh, it's interesting that Bast takes um, his uh, funding from several different uh, places. Uh, this is, w I think, two fifteenths of his income. That's what that fraction works out to be. Uh, Bast is the president of the university. Most of his funding, or at least the largest minority, comes from the fundraising department itself. Um, and uh, he does a little bit with publications, but there are other people that are doing that too. And again, nobody that I look at in here that um, looks interesting. Um, just all standard. One of the things that struck me as interesting is that at least in the document that's on the, on the web, the um, Operation Angry Badger, which is, has to do with Wisconsin and trying to help them out with, uh, or the conservatives out with their uh, uh, conflict over the teachers union. Uh, that um, is apparently a new project and gets uh, big, um, uh, big notices. It's uh, the only thing that I noticed that was done in yellow. Uh, moving on to the fundraising plan, which is uh, more interesting, I think. Uh, and again, there's the overview, and, the, and uh, uh, then it talks about the anonymous donor and the review, renewing donors. Of, this guy was really smart. He didn't even want his name known to most of the board members. Um, and now he's still anonymous, although all of the other donors, are, well, all but two of the other donors, I think, are not. Um, and uh, they have a section on personnel. They have, um, then they have their various projects. A free to choose medicine project, which apparently they're arguing for getting drugs to the public faster. Um, I guess being somewhat dissatisfied with uh, the procedures that uh, get them in now. Um, and uh, then B is the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change, and this is an off year for them, so um, they're just continuing to work on the Climate Change Reconsidered book, and they have a volume scheduled to release in 2013. Um, now this is interesting here, the way it's phrased, because we're going to come back to this. Um, they describe this as an international network of scientists who write and speak out on climate change. Heartland pays a team of scientists approximately $300,000 a year to work on a series of editions of Climate Change Reconsidered. And, um, Another 88000 is earmarked for Heartland staff, which of course would make a total of $388,000. Um, uh, then they see is their angry badger, which they're apparently quite happy about. Um, and this goes to two pages, and that's why it, uh, it's on two slides. Um, and they're spending about $612,000, which is actually more than they're doing for the IPCC. And then they have the Center for Transforming Education, which is basically arguing for uh, charter schools and working to try to get uh, uh, to help them go and also to help the government permit them to go. And uh, then... Um, um, there's the Chicago Fire Outreach, Fire Standing for Finance, Insurance, and Real Estate. And um, they're hoping to uh, tap, I, I'm not quite sure what they're doing with it, um, but they're hoping to tap the Chicago Board of Trade, and you'll see that there are some donors to this particular project. Um, um, they're going to raise 100000 for that. They have a David Pattern 
internship program, which is a proposal which, by the way, was shelved in the, med in the minutes. Um, and um, this, they're trying to get an internship. And uh, apparently Dave Patton recently passed away. And that was one of the things they were going to memorialize. They have the Cook County Public uh, Debt Project. Remember that the Heartland Institute is centered in Chicago. And they're concerned because, I think they put it, a looming financial crisis driven largely by employee pensions and health care promises that could have catastrophic results for residents and business in, this, in the county. And of course, if you're living there, that's not a, uh, something that you'd want to have happen. And so they have a project that they're working on that they run about $200,000, $210,000. Then they have um, global warming curriculum for um, K-12 schools. Dr. David Wojcik, who apparently is a consultant for the Office of Science and Technical Information at the U.S. Department of Energy. And uh, so he's putting together this uh, curriculum. And this is partly duplicated. Um, so he's moving, uh, working on modules for grades 10 to 12 and 5,000 per module, 25,000 per quarter. Um, and so they're, uh, which is 100,000 a year. Um, that becomes a little bit important later on as well. And then they talk about fracking and uh, uh, they're for it and they note that uh, there are a number of environmentalists who are against it and they're trying to raise $100,000 to have a project there. Uh, then they have a weather station project, which is uh, um, in cooperation with Anthony Watts. Um, and interestingly enough, you may remember there was an $88,000 uh, uh, thing as well. And Anthony Watts, uh, let's see, the last page of that is um, they're going to give him $88,000. And uh, then they have a section on plan giving. They try to get people to donate their wills and annuities and things like that to, uh, to the Heartland Institute. I think that's pretty common among uh, uh, institutions. I know that uh, Loma Linda has a department that will happily take your money after you die. Um, and then here's the list of all the donors. Allied Holdings, Atria, Amgen, Arthur Margulis, AT&T, um, Barney Family, Bayer Corporation, BB&T. Um, this is some, the same things, except I, I needed to get down to the bottom of the page, which was Charles G. Koch Charitable Foundation, $25,000. And let me go back here so you can see the headache. This is two, 2011 actual. This is 2012 projected. Okay, so they gave $25,000, and they're trying to up that to $200,000 if it can be done. And it goes to HCN. Now, what in the world is HCN? Well, whatever it is, it's something that Amgen and uh, Bayer Corporation will donate to. Uh, and in fact, as we go on down further, we'll see um, Desen Hall Resources, whoever that is. That doesn't help us much. Eli Lilly, HCN. Um, by the way, you'll notice that Exxon is not here. Um, uh, General Motors, GlaxoSmithKline for HCN. This sounds like some kind of a health-related thing. Um, and then there's a bunch more people who've donated various things. Um, unfortunately, there's no code that tells you what HCN exactly means. Uh, FIRE is pretty obvious, and GEO is general operating. But beyond that, I can't really tell you for sure. Um, and uh, you'll notice again that. Um, as we go through this, there's no, uh, 
there's no Shell Oil, there's no Texas Oil Company or Texaco. Um, there is Pfizer and there's RH Pharma and they're donating again to HCN. There's State Farm which is donating to FIRE so apparently that's um, uh, something that an insurance company might be interested in. Uh, here's Time Warner, here's US Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're missing other than the Koch brothers, we're missing entirely oil companies. Um, and um, then there's the, they're trying to raise more money and this is where it will all go. Notice the, the lion's share will go to the Free to Choose Medicine Project which I assume is HCN, but I don't know for sure. Um, that the Non-Governmental International Pan Panel on Climate Change, it only gets 200,000. Um, that Operation Angry Badger gets 610,000. Um, so it looks like the Heartland Institute is interested in climate change, but not Particularly, that's not their major focus. Um, now we come to the confidential memo. Given the increasingly important role the Heartland Institute is playing in leading the fight to prevent the implementation of dangerous policy actions to address the supposed risks of global warming, um, dangerous policy actions. It is useful to set priorities for our efforts in 2012. This document offers such a set of priorities. I propose that at this point it be kept confidential. I propose uh, there's no author on this. Um, it's January 2012. You may remember seeing all the other memos with centered stuff and this one is left justified. Probably doesn't mean too much, but it's an interesting change in style. Um, only distributed to a subset of institute board and senior staff. So this is their, they don't even distribute it to the whole board, according to this. More details can be found in our 2012 proposed budget document and 2012 fundraising strategy memo. So whoever is writing this obviously knows about the the fundraising and the, um, and the budget documents and is kind of referring to them. In our 2012, our efforts will focus in the following areas. Increased, and this is Heartland climate strategy. So maybe they're ignoring all of the other stuff and they're concentrating on climate. Although it's an interesting way of breaking the things up. Um, our climate work is attracted to funders, especially our key anonymous donor, whose contribution dropped from uh, 166450. Absolutely precise numbers. Whoever wrote this obviously had numbers in front of him. To 979,000 in 2011, about 20% of our total 2011 res rev revenue. He has promised an increase in 2012. See the 2011 fourth quarter financial report. We will also pursue additional support from the Charles G. Koch Foundation. They knew, whoever did this knew that the um, Charles G. Koch Foundation had paid up. Returned as a Heartland donor in 2011 with a contribution of 200, wait a minute. They returned with 25,000, remember? The 200,000 is what they hoped to get. So whoever did this yeah, has access to exact numbers, but doesn't understand what they mean. We expect to push up their level of support in 2012 and gain, their gain access to their network of philanthropists if our focus continues to align with their interests. Um, Obviously, you see, these people are all very venal, and uh, 
if we just know what their interests are, why that takes care of it. Um, nothing about whether our, our uh, projects are good in and of themselves. Um, our contribu other contributions will be pursued for this work, especially from corporations whose interests are threatened by climate policies. So, um, kind of interesting way of putting it, especially if you read the rest of it and uh, you realize how they usually say things. Development of our global warming curriculum for K-12 classroom projects. Principals and teachers are heavily biased towards the alarmist perspective. To counter this, we are considering launching an effort to develop alternative materials for K-12 classrooms. We are pursuing a proposal for David, Dr. David Wojcik to pr produce a global warming curriculum for K-12 schools. Um, and it uh, gives his bio, kind of, and then it says his effort will focus on providing curriculum that shows that the topic of climate change is controversial and uncertain. Two key points that are effective at dissuading teachers from teaching science. Now, who in the name of Pete would ever write that? From a Heartland perspective. They don't think it's science. We tentatively plan to pay Dr. Wojcik uh, 100,000 for 20 modules in 2012 while funding, with funding pledged for the anonymous donor. Whoever wrote this knew how much he was getting paid. Heartland now, funding for parallel organizations. It's a group, part of a growing network of groups, some of which we support financially. We will seek additional partnerships in 2012. At present, we sponsor the NIPCC to to undermine the official United Nations IPCC program, uh, reports. This sounds like somebody who thinks they're a villain. You don't undermine. You might correct or, um, or reply to or balance or something like that, but you don't undermine. That sounds underhanded. And uh, I mean, maybe the effect is to undermine. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that's not how they would see themselves. Um, the official United Nations IPCC reports and paid a team of, does anybody remember what they were called in the original document? Scientists. Whoever wrote this just can't quite bring himself to say scientists here. $388,000 in 2011 to work in a series of additions Expenses will be about the same. NIPCC is currently funded by two gifts a year from two foundations, both of them requesting an anonymity. Another $88,000 is earmarked this year for Heartland staff, incremental expenses, and overhead for editing and expense reimbursement for the authors. And uh, look at this carefully. There's 388, and then there's another 88,000. Again, whoever did this has the numbers in front of them but doesn't understand the meaning of the numbers. Because 388 is the total. And then uh, Heartland, uh, let's see. I think I have this. Uh, yeah, marketing is the last word of that last paragraph. Uh, funding for selected individuals outside of Heartland and their funding, Crady and So, 11,600 per month. Fred Singer, 5,000 per month. Robert Carter, 1,667 per month. They have numbers in front of them. Um, expanded climate communications, especially through our, oh, um, our in-house experts, E.G. Taylor, 
This is the m most interesting paragraph of the whole thing, actually. Uh, in fact, I think I have that all in one. Yes, I do. Um, there's limitations to how much I could clip at one time. Uh, especially through our in-house experts, through his Forbes blog and related high-profile outfits, outlets, our conferences, and through coordination with external networks, such as w UWT and other groups capable of rapidly mobilizing responses to new scientific findings. Notice how the scientist has been clipped out of the one area and now put in here. Uh, news stories or unfavorable blog posts. See, if scientific findings are part of a bad thing, including uh, unfavorable blog posts. Efforts at places such as Forbes are especially important now that they have begun to uh, allow high-profile climate scientists, such as Gleick. Who in the world is Gleick? I, I guess you're just supposed to know that, as you're supposed to know Taylor. Uh, to post warmest scientists as a counter our own, this influential audience has usually been reliably anti-climate. Can you imagine the Heartland people using that? And it is important to keep opposing voices out. Does that remind you of anything? Um, where Climate Gate, where they were saying we need to get these people out of the peer reviewed journals. Is this uh, Hartland or is this somebody who's trying to draw a, uh, a parallel? I'll leave it to you to judge, but I'll give you a little more information first. Um, Efforts might also include co cultivating more neutral voices with big audience, such as Revkin at Dot Earth New York Times. Well, that's a pretty spe specific. Who's a well-known antipathy for some of the more extreme AGW communicators, such as Ram Tenberth and Hansen, or Curry, who has become popular with our supporters. Uh, we've also pledged to raise around ninety thousand dollars. Notice that everything else is precise. Now he just kind of around ninety thousand because. 90,000 sounds bigger than 88. And besides that, 88 was used before, so you don't want to reduplicate that. In 2012, for Anthony Watts to help him create a new website to track temperature station data. It's always nice when it rounds up. The, finally, we'll consider expanding these efforts further, developing new ones if funding can be obtained. Well, <coughs> the Heartland Institute has kind of quasi admitted that the other memos are more or less accurate. They don't want to go on record as saying everything in them is exactly correct because they haven't gone through and compared exactly. They may not want to. Uh, but what they will say is that this last memo that we just read is not theirs. Well, Suspicion was directed, interestingly enough, at Peter Gleick, or Glick, I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing his name. And there's a whole bunch of people that have blogged about that, but the, I think the most interesting one for me is uh, from theatlantic.com, uh, and one of the senior editors, name is Megan McArdle, and she, interestingly enough, is a um, climate change supporter. But she says, this doesn't smell right. She says, all the people that I talk to that are climate change skeptics are, uh, this is not how they sound. And she noted a number of the things that I've pointed out to you. Um, and then a little later, the other shoe dropped. Peter Gleick. Glick, confessed to obtaining the memos unethically. And I'll read you his confession from the Huffington Post. Since the release in mid-February of a series of documents related to the internal strategy of the Heartland Institute to cast doubt on climate science, there's been extensive speculation about the origin of the documents and intense discussion about what they reveal. Given the need for reliance on facts in the public climate de debate, I'm issuing the following statement. At the beginning of 2012, I 
think I have that. Yes, I received an anonymous document in the mail describing what appeared to be details of the Heartland Institute's climate program strategy. It contained information about their funders and the Institute's apparent uh, efforts to muddy public understanding about cli climate science and policy. All of their efforts are just to muddy public understanding, not to clarify. I do not know the source of the original document, but assumed it was sent to me because of my past exchanges with Heartland and because I was named in it. Um, yeah. Given the potential impact, however, I attempted to confirm the accuracy of the information in this document. In an effort to do so, and in a serious lapse of my own and professional judgment and ethics, I think there's an extra and there, I solicited and received additional materials directly from the Heartland Institute under someone else's name, a uh, board member's name to be specific. The materials that Heartland Institute sent me confirmed many of the facts in the original document including especially their 2012 fundraising strategy and budget. I forwarded anonymously the documents I had received to a set of journalists and experts working on climate issues. Um, the smog blog being one and uh, Think Progress and uh, various other places that posted it. Um, I can explicitly confirm, as can the Heartland Institute, that the documents they emailed to me are identical to the documents that have been made public. I don't have any particular reason to um, uh, disagree with that statement. I made no changes or alterations of any kind to any of the Heartland uh, Institute documents or to the original anonymous communication. I will not comment on the substance. That, that's that, conf that confidential memo that we just went through in some detail. Okay. I will not comment on the subjects or implications of the ma uh, materials. Others have and are doing so. I only note that the scientific understanding of the reality and risks of climate change is strong, compelling, and increasingly disturbing. If somebody's using the word dangerous, it sounds like it might be him. And a rational public debate is desperately needed. Now this is fascinating. A rational public debate is desperately needed. My judgment was blinded by my frustration with the ongoing efforts, often anonymous, well-funded, and coordinated, to attack climate science and scientists and prevent this debate. And by the lack of transparency of the organizations involved. Nevertheless, I deeply regret my own actions in this case. I offer my personal apologies to all those affected. Peter Glick. Now, Glick, for those of you who don't know, was the co-founder and executive director. Um, actually, I think he's listed in the, in the uh, uh, website as president of the Pacific Institute full name being the Pacific Institute for Studies in Development, Environmental and, Environment and Security. He got his BA at Yale, his MS and PhD at Berkeley. Uh, his dissertation was on effects of climate change on water resources. He's a member of the National Academy of Science and the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. As he won the MacArthur Foundation Genius Award uh, MacArthur Foundation apparently uh, took somebody's uh, uh, money that had been welded to it by the name of MacArthur and has been giving it to various people in fairly large hunks, I think 250,000 or something like that, uh, to do with what they pleased because they were people who showed promise otherwise. And, uh, and uh, the idea is to try to make them independent of having to worry about finances so they can just do their thing. Kind of a neat idea, actually. He, interestingly, as the new task force on scientific ethics at the Geophysical U American Geophysical Union was being set up, he became their first chairman. 
the Task Force on Scientific Ethics. And he wrote The World's Water. He wrote Bottled and Sold, the story behind our obsession with bottled water. And finally, he was invited by the National Center for Science Education to be a board member as they branched out from defending evolution to including climate change as an issue in science that needed defending. Um, he has offered a resignation, and I wrote before he became an official board member. Um, but there's an interesting announcement that's still up on the webpage of the National Institute for Science Education. Um, leading climate science change experts joins an NCSE board, and of course they have his picture, and Dr. Peter Glick, president and co-founder of the Pacific Institute, has joined, past tense. Now I don't know, maybe he had been invited to join and he hasn't actually attended any meetings yet, so when he resigned he hadn't actually attended meetings, so it doesn't count. Um, uh, notice here, Dr. Glick will not be joining, but exactly how that works, I'm not sure. It sounds to me like they actually got him on board before they uh, decided hastily to cancel it. Um, it's it, uh, their, their little uh, spiel here. Um, will advise NCSE on its new climate change education initiative. Uh, Glick is certainly the right man for the job, a noted hydroclimatologist. Glick has devoted his life work to the impact of climate change on water resources. His research and writing address the critical connections between water and human health, the hydrologic impact of climate change, sustainable water use, privatization and globalization, with international conflicts over water resources. Glick has written, and he gives you those books, and then the hundreds of articles, blog posts, book chapters, reports, and peer-reviewed research papers. And then, this is fascinating. Climate change is the fundamental environmental challenge of our time, says Glick, and how we educate our citizens, and especially our children, about climate change will have repercussions for generations to come. Climate change isn't just a science issue says Glick. It's a social, political, economic issue. So it's science driven, I think, is the idea, but it, it goes into everything, including economy and poli politics and sociology. I would roll climate change into every relevant class from physics and biology to economics and political science. This next sentence is interesting. We're irreversibly committed to climate change. And we'd better understand how it works and what we can do to slow and diminish the now unavoidable impacts. Why is uh, Glick backing NNCSE's new initiative? Scientists aren't always very good at communicating the importance of science, says Glick. Communicating science is NCSE's specialty. I'm delighted that NCSE is taking on the climate change education component, says Glick. If NCSA can do for climate change what it has done for evolution education, policymakers may finally get in line to do what they should be doing. That's the announcement when he joined, and that's what they were going to do. Um, I would say temporarily those arguing for uh, uh, anthropogenic global warming got a boost. I think long term the damage is huge. They have not only now lied about uh, their, uh, oh, we're just doing science uh, and, uh, and anybody who really wants to should be able to publish in the literature. It's the reason they don't is because they're their arguments are rejected by peer review and they're no good. Um, but they conspired to keep opposing viewpoints out of the scientific journals. That's pretty obvious from the climate gate memos. And now one of them 
has made up incriminating documents about, among other things, conspiring to keep uh, uh, anthropogenic global warming advocates out of a popular magazine. As uh, Megan McArdle, who's again on the other side, says, somehow I just don't see them saying um, that, the, well, they have the peer-reviewed literature and they have the IPCC, but we've got Forbes. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Um, I think the credibility problem in this case, specifically, can only be cured by intense sunlight. We need to know who wrote that article and everything. And by s someone with unimpeachable integrity uh, taking the ball and not overstating the evidence and being very careful not to do so. Uh, but I think there's a lesson in it for everybody. And that is, which is primary, our commitment to truth or our commitment to our cause? It's real easy to say, but our cause is truth, so we should be committed to that, and therefore we can do whatever we want to. And somebody, maybe it wasn't Glick, maybe it was somebody in his circle that wrote it, slipped it to him, but that didn't come from Heartland. It just didn't. This is almost as fake as the, uh, as the Dan Rather documents. And what happens is, journalists often deal, and so do scientists, in subjects where you can't check. And so if you lose credibility, nothing you say from then on, I mean, Peter Gleck can deny it till the cows come home, but the suspicion is going to lay on him that he, wrote the, that he wrote the summary too, and he wrote it after he wrote the other stuff. It was scanned after the other stuff was scanned. The other stuff comes from Heartland. It's clearly from Heartland. It's clearly in the central zone. Uh, when, when you create PDFs, there's these little details that say who did it and what and what time and what date and what time zone. The confidential memo was created in the Pacific time zone, and it was created about somewhere around 12 hours or so before these things got posted on all the blogs. Um, it could have been scanned from a document that had been printed, but it's interesting that the document wasn't an electronic one, which is what they normally use at Heartland. And it's interesting that the document is, uh, was uh, put on paper and then reduced at that point. Um, you damage yourself a great deal. Um, for a long time, Piltdown Man was a great success. Now that it's fallen, it allows anybody who wants to to say, well, you know, how can you trust those guys? They missed Piltdown Man for 40 years. The Paluxy footprints looked like a great thing until somebody looked at them carefully and said, at least the ones that they've given us aren't real. Maybe there are some human and diamond star footprints in Paluxy, but at this point, no argument could make the case adequately to somebody who wasn't already a believer. And in fact, I think to most believers, they couldn't make the argument adequately. Once you get fraud involved, it's pretty hard to get it out. If one is willing to lie to support one's cause, then why should anyone believe when, when one tells them? unless it can be verified independently. If certain people say the sky is blue, I go outside and look. And 
journalists and scientists in particular, and Peter Glick made himself a journalist by putting this stuff up, should not lie. I guess in some sense, I'm kind of a journalist too now because I've got this thing going and we're trying to report on what's going on. We need to be extremely careful to tell the truth as we see it and also to be careful not to make the evidence more than what it is and certainly not to make up evidence. And so I kind of close by, by saying if our cause is truth, then our commitment to our cause has got to be to the commitment to truth, which means not only truth about the general broad things that we care about, but also in the way we do things. I'm going to argue that we need to be as careful to be Christian in the way we deal with people who are on the other side as not. One of the little ironies that I found out after I got done was that Peter Glick had just been invited to attend a public debate by Heartland Institute and had just declined because they wouldn't make publish, public their list of donors. His complaints above that you saw about how we need to get rational dialogue kind of fall on deaf ears at that point. He had his opportunity. He turned it down. And in fact, the Heartland Institute explained why they didn't make public their list of donors. It's because the Heartland Institute used to have a public list of donors. And then the donors started to get hate mail from various people. And finally they said, this isn't working, and they quit. Um, the New York Times noted that Big Oil was completely absent. Um, What I suspect happened was that he was so sure that there had to be big oil behind this. People had to be doing this for money because they couldn't be doing it for truth. But he tried to get some proof. It didn't work. And so he tried to make a memo that kind of summarized it and pass the whole thing off and hope nobody would notice. At least that's the most parsimonious explanation I can come up with. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was somebody in his inner circle that somehow got uh, the same memos. But we have to treat everything as if everything that we do and say will be out in the light. Because, number one, these days it's likely to happen. And number two, even if it doesn't happen in this life, there will come a time when we will be open to everybody. And some of the little things that we do that look like they were a good idea at the time uh, when nobody knew won't look like quite so good an idea. I will leave it there. Uh, and uh, invite questions and comments. I was puzzled by one statement in the apology, it's back where, or whatever that thing was. Um, he says, he made no alterations of any kind, and Heartland agrees, including the confidential memo. Isn't that what it said? Yeah. 
You mean in his confession? Yes. He said, Heartland agrees that I made no alterations in any of the stuff, including the confidential memo. Well, if he said that, he was uh, incorrect on that, wasn't he? Yeah, but I'm puzzled at that. That's uh, that is I what think I think what he actually said was he said he didn't make any changes in any of the documents, including the confidential memo. Include it, it says including the confidential memo. Yeah. I, maybe we should go back and look at that. I made no changes or alterations of any kind to any of the Heartland Institute documents or to the original anonymous communication. Oh, okay. So it depends on how you read that. And if it turns out to be a fraud, he's, he's not saying it is or isn't, I think. He's saying that what he saw, he, he just scanned and the rest is history. So. Um, it would be nice if he had a, um, an envelope or a postmark or something that would show where he got that from. But there was another statement that says, I made no changes, and the Heartland Institute will Oh, and the Heartland concurs. Institute does confirm, yes. Concurs. Let's see. That one is... Oh. Sorry about that. Um, Yeah, that's the sentence above here. I can explicitly confirm, as can the Heartland Institute, that the documents they emailed me to, uh, to me are identical to the documents that have been made public. Oh, that they emailed. So they uh, that's probably they true. They didn't email the, the fraudulent one then. I think he figured that if he was, um, that if he simply uh, took the uh, document and uh, uh, posted it, that if he changed anything, that he would be toast. I don't think he realized that he'd be toast anyway. It would probably be worse toast. And, and isn't this Koch Foundation or whatever, I mean, hasn't, haven't they just recently been denounced by Barack Obama himself? Yes, they have. And that's that the, the same, same Kochs. Okay. Uh, we have some comments over here. Uh, oh, just a minute, give him the mic. Yeah. Yeah. It's rather difficult to follow all of this. I see these Heartland Institute come home with my wife from the county commissioner's office in Tillamook, Oregon, and I read them and I scan over and I say, man, there's really vested interest in all of this, you know, uh, with the clearly a point of view. And I think, what kind, who are the people really behind all of this? I'm working on tobacco control and have really studied the history of, of how the tobacco companies took on the science as it was emerging. And so I'm saying, what do we have here? I even saw Altria on one of those lists. Maybe that wasn't one of, was the doctored one. I don't, I don't know. But you think, you know, Altria is to, big tobacco. And you think, Clearly, under the cover of global warming, you have a whole consortium of financial interests of the country that really don't want to deal with the environmental facts that we can see come out over, on, over time. And then on the other side, you have the folks that have their own vested interest within the scientific community. I'm saying, how can we really figure out what's going on? And I don't think that we can really underestimate the forces within the fictitious people, the Koch brothers and, and others, as far as the foundations, to really twist things against trying to deal with environmental change issues that to me seemed pretty obvious, just flying into San Bernardino and seeing the changes over the last hundred years you, you think happened here. I don't know, this is really interesting. Thank you very much. Well, I, you know, I'll have to say, I. There are 
I think pluses and minuses that you can argue on both sides of, of the uh, positions that uh, uh, Glick has obviously taken. I, he has to be sympathetic to the evolutionary cause or he wouldn't join forces with the NCSC, whose primary, primary uh, goal is to reinforce evolution. Uh, you know, one of the things that was interesting is if you read the NCSC uh, comments, all they're really wi willing to stand behind is that, one, it's getting warmer, and two, that carbon dioxide plays a role. And they don't want to get involved in, uh, uh, although it sounds like Glick wants them to, but uh, they don't want to get involved in, you know, uh, should we have carbon tax, should we have... Uh, uh, should we have, or should we just have education of some kind, uh, uh, mandated caps, you know, that kind of thing, um, that this, they didn't want to go get into the solution for global warming. They just wanted to argue that, yes, it was there, and yes, that we're partly responsible or mostly responsible, I think they'd say. Um, so uh, I, you know, it's interesting because you don't normally think of these things as connected, but obviously some people are starting to see a connection uh, that, they, that they want. And I think there are several things that, if you're going to do a deal with global warming, that you have to deal with. Um, one of them is is it actually happening? And if so, how much? Uh, one of them is, um, uh, are we doing it, or half of it, or a quarter of it, or none of it? Um, and one of them is, what's the best cure if there is a problem, assuming there is a problem? And and all of those are different steps, and it looks like the, uh, the NCSC is getting cold feet on the very last one. But, uh, uh, but is uh, willing to argue for all of the other ones pretty strongly. Um, uh, uh, one of the interesting things that I saw was there's a movie uh, that sort of like an inconvenient truth, only it's, uh, it's done in the world's water supply and it has to do with global warming and what, it's, and what it's doing with it. And the first example they gave of the impact of global warming on the water supply is the drought in central California. Um, those of you who may know, uh, the reason for that drought doesn't have anything to do with rain. <laughs> it has to do with the Delta smelt and uh, environmentalist efforts to keep us from diverting so much water that the smelt dies and uh, uh, that the um, Central Valley is therefore not getting as much water as it used to. And that's not, that has very little to do with global warming per se. Um, again, I... While I think that's not a good way of proceeding, it sounds good at first, but then uh, when it can be picked apart pretty easily, I, it makes you look like a fool. Um, I think that, one, you have to be careful not to say that everything, el everything else that they say is wrong, um, because it isn't necessarily. And two, that you have to be real careful that we don't do any of the same kinds of things that are being done here. Um, let's see, I think we had a comment back here, and then, uh, uh, we well, we're, we're trying to record you for posterity, too, so. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most important things about the climate change debate and the information that's coming out about how things have been, have been modified because people believe so strongly in their position that they're willing to modify the truth or strongly interpret things with partial truth is that it is at least finally casting a little bit of doubt on the integrity of science, which they use as, as a method to say Christians are wrong and Christian scientists are wrong. The only true truth comes from scientists that do pure science 
et cetera. And this is probably one of the best examples right now out in front of the public debate of a lack of integrity that we that permeates all of society is not suddenly gone in the scientists that are part of that society. If they believe strong enough in a in a particular belief system, then they're going to support that blindly at times and modify the, the facts to fit their their truth. And I think it's probably one of our best examples for for the average person to question the, the quotes absolute truth of quotes, quote scientists when they make their grand statements. Which um, helps us in the debate on evolution at this point at least get people to say we ought to have an open debate. Yeah, I agree. I haven't personally followed the uh, global warming debate other than maybe newspaper articles and magazine articles. But to do really serious study, I haven't. Uh, I am interested because my master's degree was in paleoclimatology using pollen as an indicator of climate changes of the last 12, 15,000 years, and that's in my master's thesis. So I'm interested in where we're heading. Now, I have a question on this. It's out of ignorance, and you know, when you have all those medically oriented uh, donors like Eli Lilly, there's a pattern there. Um, are they wanting to take sides because they feel the global warming advocates, the uh, really, really progressives who are advocating there is global warming and want to have a carbon uh, tax, that's going to siphon money away from health care? What is their motive for getting involved? Oh, it's real simple. It's, they don't have a motive for getting involved with that. They're not, they're, not, they're, not, they're not donating to that. Let's be very clear. HCN is health care something. And so what's really happening is they're donating to, I presume it's that uh, a medicine free for all kind of thing. Uh, uh, that uh, their number one, you know, the, the A exhibit. That's what that's donating. And that's what the Koch brothers donated to. And whoever read this had such green glasses on that he could not see the Koch brothers uh, donating to something other than climate change. And so he went and ran with it, and he was wrong. See, um, yeah, I, in nothing we've said here makes, uh, makes uh, you know, is a definitive ref refutation of any of the steps along climate change, whether it's that it's happening or that it's caused by us or that it's, um, uh, or that it's detrimental or that um, we should do something about it or that the thing we should do is to use carbon tax or cap or something like that. Uh, those points all have to be argued independently. I think what this does do is it stops people from using, but the scientists all say, and you're all supposed to shut up and not, a not ask questions. And I think that's one of the lessons that comes out in it, and it relates to uh, the evolution controversy. But the scientists all say isn't a good enough excuse. That science is not run by consensus, science is run by the evidence. Um, now, having said that, I think there is some evidence that uh, a significant amount of global warming has taken place. Um, there are some really nice uh, photos of the, uh, of the uh, ice cap in the North Pole that strongly suggest that there's less uh, uh, ice than there was before. Uh, we were just up in Canada and saw a glacier that has been retreating and retreating and retreating, and now when we go to visit it, you have to walk past all these mounds that used to be under ice. So something is going on there, and global warming is uh, probably the best hypothesis. And even though there has been some evidence of um, and shall we say less than reliable data in some of the uh, in some of the stations that have been measuring the temperature. Uh, 
it's, I think if you were to try to be t perfectly fair with the evidence, I don't think it can account for more than about half of the numbers that are, are being generated, that the other half are in fact real. So, you know, for what it's worth, if somebody asked me if I believe that global warming is happening, as a general trend, I would have to say yes. Um, maybe not quite as much as they say, but certainly I think it's happening. Uh, yes? There is an article that where they uh, had documented where the original sites were, where they were measuring the temperatures, and then subsequently those temperature monitors were moved to a new location within the same area, and each time they were moved toward either a power plant or an industrial complex which uh, made the temperature readings from that particular sensor a higher reading because it was now moved to an environment which had a uh, higher ambient temperature. Rather, rather interesting. And none were moved away. They were all moved closer. Closer. Now, here's what's happened with that. Uh, Anthony Watts, who's been a critic of uh, global warming for some time because of that, has gone around and looked at a lot of the stations and seen where they are, where they were, and so forth, and documented a lot of this stuff. And the response, I think, was an appropriate one. And that is, they went around and looked at ones that were, in fact, secure. And they're now, uh, they're now, you can, if you want to, separate out the data. And in fact, one of the things that the Heartland Institute was going to do was the government decided not to separate the data, but sim simply to note which ones they were and then let them go and then feed them into the, 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 the uh, uh, entire record so that it wasn't easy to separate them out. And Anthony Watts is going to go and do the hard work of saying, well, what does this station say? What does that station say? What does that station say? Add them all up and then compare them. My understanding is what little comp uh, com um, comparing has been done has shown about half of the normal or the, the standard belief system of global warming. And that's why I say I kind of, if I can put it that way, I half believe it. Uh, I think that there's some going on, it's just not as much as they think. And my best guess would be about 50%. But that's, um, you know, I could be wrong. It might be 70, it might be 90. I doubt it's 100% because there's too many of them that have been kind of played with a little bit. Uh, yeah, in one case, uh, they moved it next to an airport. Uh, a lot of heat on the tarmac, and it just makes sense that it would be hotter there. And in fact, if you look at the, the graphs, they're higher. Well, that data should be removed from the from the uh, data pool and the and data readjusted and see see what happens to it. But I think even if you do that, you're not going to get rid of the entire warming episode. Uh, a couple of hands over here. Um, well, I was wondering about uh, numerous number of records that show that. Uh, you know, the ice packs used to come over North, North America uh, back several thousand miles from the poles. And all that melted long before there was an industrial uh, age, before anyone even dreamed of it. So you're talking about a tremendous amount of continents of ice have disappeared. So we assume that suddenly uh, uh, 100 years of man's... Uh, uh, production is uh, doing so much, or is there some, or is this just what we would expect? To some well, extent, there are there are some problems, and one of them is how many ice ages were there? If there was only yeah. one, uh, then uh, the attempt to deal with that thing that you know it's gone been going on for four million years is a uh, is a, uh, a fool's errand, and now we have to assess, well, why did it start? Why did it stop? And I don't think any of us know for sure at this point. Um, 
And that, that's one of the things that's interesting is that people will make extrapolations from carbon dioxide levels in um, ice cores. And they may or may not mean uh, anything. And we, we're going to have to take a lot of what is said of the longer haul with uh, several grains of salt. Yeah, I think it's going to take a while. Yeah. I would think. Um, let's see, comment here and then back to... Uh, you may recall that there was a um, suggestion of strong correlation between uh, our temperature and solar cycles and uh, the ice and so on, which was fairly recent. And I don't know what the latest is on that. It was fairly striking. But uh, putting all the recent data aside, get into the fossil record, you're faced with the fact that uh, uh, it's probably presumptuous of us to say that global warming is due to internal combustion engine uh, because we've had apparently so much warmer temperatures in the past, and we, long before the internal combustion engine ever existed. You never know. Maybe the antediluvians were more advanced than we so thought. It, uh, <laughs> well, uh, you go into that model. I'll, I'll let you go there by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there with you. Anyway, uh, what, uh, we, we've got dinosaurs in Antarctica. Oh, yeah. We have trees growing five degrees from the South Pole. Uh, in Antarctica, we've got uh, salamanders in Spitsbergen of the Arctic Circle in the north and so on. There's a little question that the Earth was much warmer, or at least uh, warm temperatures were distributed much more evenly over the Earth than they are now. Uh, I'd be a little bit cautious it's about that because it's arguable that Antarctica wasn't where Antarctica is today. Uh, that's one of the continents that's considered to be fairly stable. In the, in the whole picture, so it, uh, th there is a counter argument to that, uh, but it's you know, the fossil record seems to suggest uh, warmer temperatures in the past, uh, probably before uh, Noah's aunt, uh, Ferrari, whatever he drove around. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> anyway. I guess coming to Sabbath school, we come to think in terms of the mysteries of God and to, and to try to come to some understanding of truth. And when we leave, we, we say, well, I, don't, I have some glimmers, but I really haven't mastered it all. As I was thinking about all of this, I was thinking about something I was told here at Loma Linda, follow the money when you're looking at research. And so as I see this stuff come from Heartland, I'm saying, where's the money coming from and what's the purpose? And as I'm thinking in terms of, of what's happened, the agendas that are out there, whether it be one side or the other, follow the money. And you say, well, look at all those lists of, of donors, and why are they giving? Are they wanting to create a climate in America where they can have more laissez-faire and less regulation so they can go on and do their business in the world as, as far as oil companies and so forth? Well, you know, the, opposed to the, the forces that would is, have more to deal with the commons. The, the, the oil companies are donating, actually, to the environmental groups. Um, if, you wanted to, if you wanted to say anything, you'd say it was protection money. Um, so, uh, you, you know, I, I, think, I, think that, I think that one of the things that, one of the things that we've learned out of this is that... Is that uh, one of the things we've learned out of this is that it is not, uh, this particular thing at Heartland is not driven by oil companies or uh, energy companies in general. That the one oil company you might be able to point to actually donated to a different fund entirely. Uh, and not very much at that. Uh, On the other hand, I, if you want to follow the money, you have to ask why the uh, United Nations supports uh, a, uh, uh, a report which is, uh, unfortunately, has some sections in it that are pretty sloppily written. And in some cases, the, the citations are just horrible. Um, 
And they have their own agenda too. And that is, if they can manage to make this kind of thing worldwide, they may be able to sit on top of an umbrella and finally get their own taxes instead of donations from everything else. So you may be seeing money there that's, that's got its purposes as well. And their money, it dwarfs Heartland. Heartland is, what, um, 200000 for their IPC and IPCC. Um, you know, the money that goes into the IPCC makes this look like a drop in the bucket. So uh, if you're following the money, that money might be interesting to follow. There is an illusion out there that companies are evil. And frankly, I'm not going to argue too much with that, although I will say that uh, Johnson & Johnson and their reaction to Tylenol was a pretty good one. Um, but that the companies, the, they, they have a hidden agenda, and so they're not going to be honest, and they'll, they'll try to fudge the truth where they can, and so forth and so on. But somehow the implication is that, well, the government is, you know, that's us, and, uh, uh, and we're in it for honesty and openness and all that stuff. Um, well, the government... I think one of the things that America grew up with was a healthy suspicion of government. And I think if we lose that, we're in trouble. Uh, government itself has its own agendas. And that as long as one is following, following money, one needs to follow government money too. Uh, yes. There's a interesting uh, map that's from uh, one of the ancient uh, explorers that shows Greenland, and Greenland before it was covered with ice had evidently some type of a river down the middle of it, and it shows locations of several different uh, settlements in the middle of Greenland uh, along this beautiful uh, river valley. Now that's an interesting one. Um, I can bring a copy of the uh, map to you. There, there, uh, there is that, that warming period and uh, the evidence for it is pretty clear. Uh, when the Vikings got here, they called uh, Newfoundland uh, Vinland, which literally translated as Vineland. And uh, most people really wouldn't consider growing vines at, in uh, Newfoundland at this point. Um, and I do have. I do have a couple of questions about that. And the reason that I have them is this, that when they do ice cores, it looks like they can get down below 2,000 uh, years ago pretty reliably, uh, that they have identified, uh, probably the, the most important one is they've identified uh, little bits of uh, uh, ash from the explosion in Thera which uh, conventional age is about 1,300 or something like that, 1,600, somewhere in there. So if that's for real, then, then it can't have melted over the entire Greenland. Um, and the, uh, and uh, I think we just had in Sabbath school somebody pointing out that uh, lead level went up about 2,000 years ago, and then came and went back down, and then it came back up again as we started using leaded gasoline. Uh, there's enough evidence there that convinces me reasonably, I think, that at least some parts of Greenland must have still had ice on them. Maybe we're fortunate and we're drilling into uh, uh, some kind of... Uh, uh, glacier that was there before, and it just got more uh, adequate. But I, don't th I, I think I'd be cautious about any hypothesis that said that all of Greenland was free of ice, uh, just because of the evidence that we have elsewhere. Uh, but I, yeah, if you, have the, if you have the map, I'd be interested in looking at it and, and finding out where its providence is and so forth. 
Uh, one last comment, and then I'm going to. Yeah, I would discuss just a little bit the question of loss of credibility here. And uh, it's an interesting issue to me. And uh, I think we should always, Christians should always hold themselves to the highest uh, standards of integrity and credibility and so on. But that you can't recover from that, I'm not so sure, depending on how society evaluates you. And I, I refer to our current political uh, situation where uh, all kinds of things are said and wrong things are said and so on, and we uh, tend to forget about it in a month or two and uh, go down another path. Uh, we don't hold politicians to the same level of integrity as we do uh, scientists to a certain extent, depending on uh, which scientists you're dealing with, or ourselves as Christians, we should be uh, the highest level of integrity. And uh, if society doesn't care too much about integrity, and you know, and society is now in a very strong relationship thing, it's relationships that counts, you know, and who cares about the data, uh, some of these people could recover. Well, uh, actually, I think uh, Glick made a partial start. It may have been a complete start. It depends on who actually wrote that memo. If it was somebody else, then Glick comes out and says, hey, I fished for the, for the other corroborating documents. That's my fault. Now, why, if he fished for it to corroborate it, he didn't note that there were certain errors in the document itself, uh, I'm a little bit, uh, that gives me a little pause, but let's supposing that, let's supposing that he were to f go on to produce a document and an envelope that came in with a, you know, uh, stamp and everything, and, and uh, the stamp is before he went trying to get out the, um, uh, the documents from the Heartland Institute, if that were to actually happen, I think that he could decently recover. I think this limited confession will only work if there's limited guilt. If there's more guilt, then he's hung, period, uh, because even when he's caught, he won't tell the truth. Um, and at that point, actually, though, maybe we should all be operating like this. Don't trust me. Trust the data that I, got, uh, that I got here. And if you don't trust it, do your own and find out whether I'm correct. That's the beauty of science is you can say, well, you know, you don't like my experimental results. Try them yourself. Uh, and that's why science is probably more honest than just about any other profession is because you have that problem. Uh, that if you try to if you try to cover things up, um, uh, that that somebody else can uncover them, uh, and I think that that's people are mendacious enough to begin with. It does help. It does help to have some controls on it, uh, and and so while what I'm saying could sound like bashing science, it's not really. Um, it's just showing that, that what goes on with uh, other things can also affect science. Uh, but all of us, I think, in addition to being personally honest, should be very careful not to try to create a, a deliberate trust relationship. Eventually, there'll be one anyway. Because if everything you say is true and everybody who checks it out, you know, he quotes this paper. Yes, that paper did exactly say what he said it said, you know. That after you've checked about 50 times, you go, yeah, I believe that, and yeah, I believe that, and, and, and move on. Um, but that's kind of, uh, if I can say, an earned trust, and it's a trust that could be reversed at any time. You read this, well, I believe all of the stuff that he said here, but he got down to here, and are you really sure of that? Um, but fortunately, he has a footnote, so you can go back and you can say, well, he got this information from here, here, and here, and here's how he combined them. And 
And you go back, and yep, that's the right information. Yep, that's the right information. Yep, that's the right information. And uh, the combination makes sense. So that it, in, a, in a real sense, we should all be trustworthy, but we should all act like we don't want anybody to have to trust us as much as is humanly possible. And I guess that's where I would leave the discussion at this point is that's the lesson in it for us. Don't do anything that you wouldn't want to defend in the great judgment, number one. And number two, try not to have other people trust you so much as they trust the data that's behind it. And with that, I'll quit. Um, those of you who are here next week will get to see an attempt to play it straight down the middle on the um, uh, on carbon fourteen in Egyptian dynasties. <laughs> <laughs>